Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. The news of another migrant drama off the coast of Italy in late February led to familiar expressions of shock by EU leaders and familiar calls for the EU to reform its migration and asylum policy. Dozens of people are thought to have died in the Mediterranean this year, not just near Italy, but also off the coasts of Libya and Tunisia. The EU's border agency says irregular arrivals increased by 64% in 2022. And Brussels is concerned by the growing influx along the land route as well, known as the Western Balkans route. To discuss what reforms are needed and what is realistic, I'm joined by Carlo Ressler, a Croatian MEP from the centre-right European People's Party. Welcome to you. Thank you for the invitation. Also pleased to join Beatrice Covasi, an Italian MEP from the Socialists and Democrats. Welcome to you as well. Hello, pleasure so to be here. Let's start with this, th this latest series of, of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean near Italy. We often hear about the problem of smugglers and the impossibility, it seems, of doing something to stop them. What do you think needs to be done? It is uh, really the aftermath of this uh, nth tragedy, shocking tragedy uh, of our shores. President of the Republic, Mattarella, was uh, um, visiting, uh, you know, the, the place, Crotone, and uh, what comes first to the spirit is really, do we have to witness another tragedy like this? For how long? This year it will be the 10th year anniversary of a big shipwreck uh, uh, of Lampedusa, uh, where, you know, 400 people died. Um, so clearly for us it's a very acute problem. And uh, the response that the Italian government is giving at the moment to say, oh, just stop, you know, prevent them from leaving, it's very simplistic. So the first thing to say is that to stop smugglers, to stop human trafficking, what is really sorely missing, I would say now, still at the European level, is to have a fully-fledged migration policy. We need to have all elements. We need to have uh, those already in the Dublin reform, uh, you know, the migration pact that we are discussing. We need to have uh, also legal pathways to migration, and we need to have, of course, some uh, common search and rescue. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to, to those other points. Just on what you said about how difficult it is to stop uh, them actually leaving their countries in the first place. I want to put that point to Carlo Ressler. Is it unrealistic to stop migrants leaving uh, African countries, for example, or Asia? The fact is that there will always be people who want to come to Europe and that uh, to one extent also shows that Europe is still uh, pr probably the most promising place to live in, uh, in the world, and uh, this is good. But at the same time, it is also quite clear that it is not possible that Europe will be the solution for all the injustices of this world, and that the European system of asylum and migration can really solve all these problems. We have to have, uh, of course, uh, legal pathways, but we also have to be sure that as many people as possible are really familiar with the situation, are familiar with the difficult and dangerous trip, uh, journey towards Europe, and this is something that still can be done, and in th this sense, the conclusions of the European Council go in the right direction. But do you agree that breaking this economic model of the smugglers, which is something the EU has talked about for years, uh, it just doesn't work because the smugglers have their relationships with the Iranian border police, the Pakistani border police, the Turkish border police, and so forth. The EU can't do much about that. But that doesn't mean that it's not possible to do anything. And I mean, I think that Really, when we compare our current situation now, when we compare the atmosphere here in Brussels, but also in the other capitals um, to the situation in 2015, I think that we have really come to the conclusion that it is possible to protect our external borders and that uh, still more can be done. But in these eight years, a lot has already been done. And uh, we see that uh, this is the first step. This is obviously not enough. It's not enough also to be present in the third countries and try to uh, tell the people what are the dangers and tell the people, uh, tr try them really to understand what does, the, does it mean to have a right to the international uh, protection, uh, asylum, and what does it mean to be an economic migrant. We can obviously yes. understand mm -hmm. the um, 
wish of all the people, human wish to come to Europe to live in a better world, but it really does not at the same time equals the economic migrants to the refugees and this difference is really Indeed. important. Indeed, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, at the same time, you know, uh, it is not so clear cut uh, as you would recognize in many situations, you know, you have, we have an increasing number of uh, climate migrants. We will have it in the future even more. Uh, we have immense tragedies uh, happening, you know, uh, and in, in some cases, uh, like with Ukraine, uh, we were very eager and, and uh, happy, and we are happy to provide, for instance, temporary uh, protection schemes, uh, but we don't have the same schemes in place for other places, uh, which are very important. Well, uh, uh, under international law, it is clear that an economic migrant is different from an asylum seeker, but in practical terms, when people don't have paperwork when they arrive somewhere. That's a, a big obstacle, I would, I would Absolutely. Say. But also, I mean, uh, the, the desperation note that we struck here. Uh, again, you know, uh, no mother would put his child at risk. Uh, none of us would, no father, you know, none of us would. Uh, I think the level of desperation of some people, you know, to go to throughout those routes uh, has also to be addressed. Uh, so education is important, awareness certainly, but the accent until now has been really more on fortress Europe indeed. Uh, and uh, it, it hasn't been enough uh, into seeing Europe and migrants also as a resource, reversing the issue, you know, when we talk about economic migrants, for instance. Should, should there be more legal pathways opened for migrants into the EU? There should be really clear, normal legal pathways to Europe, but I think that it's really the first thing is that we should distinguish between the two because the legal uh, difference obviously exists. But it's not only the legal difference. Uh, Europe has really showed uh, its solidarity, showed its uh, heart in a way also now towards the few million Ukrainian migrants who are now here, who are in Europe at the European territory, uh, mostly women and children. At the same time, we should really be open and we should be start with a human approach towards every human being who is trying to find a better uh, future for themselves, for their families here in Europe. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we should not be firm against those who try to abuse the system. And the fact is that uh, almost two thirds of all the applications uh, for the asylum in Europe are declined, are really are not justified in and a way. And very few of the, according of to course. the European Commission, very few of those whose applications are rejected actually go back to their own countries, it's 21%. That's also one part of the problem and it really doesn't have sense. If we are trying to establish a just European system of migration and asylum, then those who really have the opportunity to stay here, who have legally justified grounds for staying in at the European territory should really be distinguished from those who do not have that. So, on, we have the, the problems so at different levels, <laughs> as, well, yeah. as we can see in this debate. But, but on the legal oh. pathways, what yeah. kind of migration would you want to attract? Because there is an argument that taking away, for example, qualified nurses from Niger or Sudan deprives those countries of that kind of workforce. There are shortages of nurses in French hospitals, for example. I think the, the whole point is we should really make analysis, uh, you know, and start reflecting more widely on this issue. And, uh, and we should uh, uh, make a, an assessment Europe-wide assessment on our need, based on our needs. If you look at, you know, uh, the current 0.6% uh, 0 0 .6 of the population, uh, of European populations are refugees. If you look at their current employment, you see in which categories they fall, you know. And uh, most of them uh, really work in areas where European citizens uh, do not want to work, you know, going from uh, cleaners, to make an example, or, you know, very low paid agricultural works, uh, uh, construction building, etc., etc. So we clearly have to make an assessment uh, and uh, the blue card that we have, which is uh, very few people listening to us will know about the blue card. The I'm, blue I'm, card. Yeah, you, you see, it's like uh, <laughs> it's the European green card, but very right. few people know about it. Uh, and it's for highly specialized workers. So clearly that's not... Uh, the solution or the answer to the issue. But, but even on the lower paid jobs, is, is that a problem to, to take people uh, and from, from poor countries and not pay them the same as what uh, a French citizen, for example, or Croatian citizen would get? We all have uh, really high European social standards as well, so I don't think it's really possible that uh, that level of payment would be lower than for exactly, those who are exactly. here. But at the same if time... If we're talking about a legal situation, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, of yes. course. 
But this is uh, to, to uh, some extent also an issue uh, within the European Union. But uh, what I really think it's uh, even uh, more important in this case is the issue of integration. This is not the competence of the European Union. This is in the hands of the national governments. But we also see, and we have to be honest about that, that uh, within European Union we really have uh, some cases which are more successful and some which are not. And we do not have, want to really end up in the, those kind of scenarios in which we have uh, parallel societies created, but we should really uh, try to work together on that integration uh, in local communities, but especially on the national level. Should, should there be more of a debate in European societies about these cultural changes that inevitably come with major labor migration because that doesn't seem to be happening much absolutely at the moment. and uh, and i think we should focus also on successful examples of integration in my own country you know there are some communities from eritrean to filipinos to many others but are integrated have been integrated for decades uh, and still uh, they don't seem to blend uh, into the into the national uh, uh, community so much into the national life, uh, uh, we should think European really. We should think that Europeans are also the second generation, third generation Europeans uh, who live with us, uh, who live by our, our own uh, uh, norms, uh, and and have a debate on positive integration. Uh, in a future which unfortunately sees Europe uh, in a sharp demographic decline. Let's not forget you know, that we are a continent which is getting incredibly older and, uh, and we need to think forward and to think wider. Well, I think we need to wrap up there. I'd like to thank my guests, Carlo Ressler and Beatrice Covasi. That's the end of part one of Talking Europe. Join me in a few minutes for the second part after the news bulletin here on France 24.